So good afternoon here from the Emirates Golf Club. I am joined here today by Dave Aldred, the performance coach. Welcome Dave to Emirates Golf Club. Thank you. So today we're going to go over a few topics on how to learn and train effectively and then switch that to on-course performance. Now Dave has worked with the likes of Johnny Wilkinson, Luke Donald and Francesco Molinari. So here today we're going to go through a few things that uh, hopefully can help you guys that are watching. So first of all, Dave, um, let's go through your your book, uh, Pressure Principle, um, and any of the things that are in there that we can relate to golf coaching and um, on-course performance. Well, there, there are two facets, really. One, um, particularly the chapter on language, where I'm looking at like, my productive language to try and get people um, into what we call the ugly zone, in other words, get to the stage or get to the the edge of their performance so that they're trying to do one more. So just to give you a simple example, if somebody can do 10 or something, the ugly zone starts at 10 and 11 is going to be really difficult and so on. And that and that is where learning happens. And to be able to create an environment where the player has their self-esteem intact and can be totally committed in terms of his attitude and his application, okay, it is language and how we communicate that actually makes the difference. Okay. Um, and and it's it's frightening to me how many coaches don't spend time looking at how they communicate. You know, there's a great saying. You know, the meaning of the message is the response you get. And and what tends to happen is. Uh, that a lot of people, if they don't get what they want, they say the same thing but louder or slower. But actually, they need to change the message completely. So it's um, it, there's a lot of work in there, and I've divided it up into negative language, positive language, and productive language. And uh, without going into too much detail, um, negative language is any language where you're asking somebody to not do something. Okay. So, you, you know, rather, let's say you're working with a player and, and he's taking the club on the inside and then it comes up and he's going to throw it as a result of going on the inside. The temptation, quite naturally, is to say, well, you know, don't take the club on the inside. Yeah. Okay. Well, what will happen is you then start this process of negative avoidance, which is actually... I'm more concerned about not making a mistake than I am about trying to achieve. So what you sh should do is, okay, you want to give him something that if he achieves it, it makes it impossible to do what you're trying to get him to, to not do. If you like. So a stick in the ground that's slightly leaning back on the plane would be something, let's see if you can play. And then you might want to exaggerate and put the stick a little bit further forward so you go beyond where he needs to be. So he gets the feeling of discomfort, not at the end point in terms of performance, but beyond the end point. And then the learning is a lot deeper. Um, so that's, that's the, the main thing ab about trying to make sure that the person is totally committed to wanting to do something rather than trying to avoid something. Okay. So in terms of um, getting that person to feel uh, the improved movement or the correct movement, so to speak, um, when I'm on the range coaching a vast number of golfers, whether it's a complete beginner or a tour professional, I'd, I'd implement a training aid just to give them a feeling or a, a visual of what they've got to try and achieve. Um, and by, by doing that, they're getting a feeling. Um, and I would only get them to do it between sort of three to five golf balls or three to five repetitions of a movement before changing the task, making it varied um, to give them a real sort of insight to what they're trying to uh, achieve. What, what, what's your thoughts on rep number of repetition and that type of thing? I, I think, I mean, first of all, uh, coming on, you know, if, you, if you're using a training aid that pushes you beyond where it's comfortable to be, 
So an exaggeration, yeah? Exaggeration. So you go way beyond um, what you're trying to do. Um, so, for example, if somebody, you know, you say you want somebody to get in a position where you want them to cover a ball, okay? So one of the practices might be, okay, I want you to hit the ball, but I'm going to place it on the ground, not on a tee. I'm going to place it three inches past your left foot. Yep. Now I've really got to exaggerate. Yes, of course. Yep. Okay? So I'd rather have them do that and they go, oh, this is really awkward. And I said, right, and then move the ball back to the area that you first want them to go to. Yeah, yeah. And as long as you explain that to individuals, say, look, and, and also, you know, I, th I think the, the, the worst thing a golf pro, particularly a proficient player, can say is, it's easy. Because what will happen is I'll go uh, and you say, look, just quite straightforward, go beyond the thing and you'll find it quite easy. I know it's difficult. And you're telling me it's easy. So there must be something wrong with me. I, I'm struggling here. And straight away, self-doubt, self-worth, self-esteem just starts to crumble a little bit. But if you actually say, Dave, the first time you do this, oh, it's going to feel horrible. Yeah. It's really going to feel awkward. Then I don't mind putting myself in. You said it's okay. You're not expecting I, results from Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, so therefore, for you to have an empathy as a coach with the learner is crucial. Um, so that's the, the, the part of exaggerating. So if you've got a, a training aid that makes you go well beyond the point at which you need to go, um, you know, then I'm a thousand percent for it because it's far better to learn a position to be able to come back to it than it is to ah, just about get there because we know if we're under pressure we'll be nowhere near it yeah for sure so if i was gonna if i was teaching somebody for example and we needed to work on the takeaway like we said the slightly inside or slightly outside whatever it may be i, I generally go through two, three or four different exercises or different drills or different training uh, aids to try and really get them to, again, exaggerate the feeling of where we need to get them to be now. I'll get them to hit three or five shots maximum before they change the exercise or the drill. And there's generally always one exercise that they like particularly more than another, even though it's creating the same feeling or the same movement yeah. effectively. I think, well, there's a couple of things there. Um, I, I really do like the idea of having slightly different approaches to get to the same thing. It keeps the brain fresh. The second thing, which I totally applaud you for, is actually reps of five or six. Now, in, in rugby, I use six. Um, it doesn't matter why. But golf, I like five. And the reason I like that is that... If I want to do, let's say, uh, as somebody says, right, I need to do this. I need to do at least 25 reps a day of practicing going back to the stick or going by, by playing uh, on, on the edge of the stick. If I do 25, one after another, then the only deep learning comes from the first one. Yeah. So in a horrible way, 49 of them are a waste of time. And you all say, yeah, but it reinforces well, okay, number two might, number three might, number four, not sure, number five, and now we're into just repeat, 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 repeat. So if I say, right, instead of doing 25 of these, we're going to do five sets of five, yeah. that gives me five opportunities for that one first shot, which is our match shot. Yeah. So already, if you look at the process of behavior matching, we're already closer to a match behavior and the other thing is that five i can hang on to five yeah you know i can still keep the brain alive and if you tutor the individual to think about the same thing slightly differently then you really are in a, in a good place in terms of the learner making progress yeah for sure and then on the flip side of that you've got the training to learn and the training to perform so Again, a lot of the people that I coach, um, I like to go through the learning phases first, and then I then get them to relate the same sort of process, whether it be three or five golf balls, depending on the level of golf. So obviously, if you've got a, an elite professional, for example, I'll reduce the amount of balls for that particular yeah. performance challenge as such. And then if it's a, a, a beginner, 
I'll then obviously increase the amount of balls. So again, they're getting a better understanding of what they're trying to actually achieve. So when I'm, when I'm giving coaching program, it's all about how to learn effectively and then relating that to performance so we can actually get that out onto the golf course because most of the golfers that I deal with are all happy to stand on the range in the same spot and hit a 7 iron 50 times, 100 times. And actually, like you say there, after the fifth repetition, sixth repetition, they're actually not gaining anything from that. So going from training to learn and training to perform, what, what is the biggest significant difference there that you find from the, from the two? Well, I think, I think the one thing that we need to be aware of, that if you're asking anybody to do anything different, I mean, those people that are musicians will know, here's a new piece of music to learn. There is a, what I call the ugly zone. It's a messy area where it's full of angst and frustration. I oh, missed that note again, start again, etc., etc. And I find golf is actually really ugly. <laughs> and, um, and there is a lot of stuff. So, so if, I'm, if I'm determined to try and get this right, okay, and I, and I work, on my tech, work on my technique and I've got the technique right, Okay, or acceptable as far as you're concerned. Now the question is, okay, now can I actually uh, put that in place and start being accountable for results? So let's just say it's it's um, chipping, yeah. just for the sake of argument. Okay, right. So I've worked on the chip. I've worked on my I'm, I'm pinching the ball. I've worked on my trajectory. I've done all of that. Now. You're standing 25 yards away next to a pin. So right there, okay. How many does it take you to get five within three feet? So I have to, right, okay. Now all of a sudden, yes, I'm on the process, but I'm being assessed on the outcome. And, and the ugly zone in that is ball rolls and you put the, the pitching wedge in the hole and if the handle touches the ball, it's in. If it doesn't, it's out. And I've been in many occasions where the guy's saying, you know, can you stretch the shaft a little bit? <laughs> is it in, is it in? Because if, it's, if it doesn't touch the handle, it's out, yeah. end off. So, you know, and, and it's a bit sort of tough um, to, to, to manage in terms of its brutal honesty about it. But it gets players in that. Level. So it's going from that technical learning phase to obviously performance phase, which is obviously relation to the to the the, 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 yeah, to the outcome, yeah. to being target focused. The, the, the other important point of this is, and, and you have to spend time with players to get them to understand this. If you totally mentally commit to trying to do something, so we're talking about application yeah. and attitude, and you don't achieve your outcome, the brain still learns. Okay. Now, it might not be comfortable, but that's why we go through these plateaus of learning where you try, 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 and you keep doing, I still can't get this flop shot where I have the toe down and blah, whatever it is. Okay. And then all of a sudden, for one day, you just do it. And you go, well, what was all the fuss about? It was the brain that's getting battered by your commitment to want to learn eventually makes those, let's just call them, neuro highways okay yeah. i'll do it you've been pestering me long enough and the brain does something different and changes and and that's what you're trying to do now interestingly and this is where i I'd sort of kind of take issue with with coaches in that you need a bit of vibe and excitement now if you look at young children four or five year olds and they're getting ready to go and play or they're going to do a new game or they're going to learn something new they're vibrating with excitement. Yeah. And that's one of the things, one of the green arrows that I call, that you need to get in the ugly zone. I need to be enthusiastic about this. And sadly, adults, it's not very cool to be enthusiastic. But actually, it, you, you need to get them on that train. You yeah. know? Um, and I think that's just the... Uh... Again, for me as a coach, it's trying to educate the, the students, whether, again, it's a complete beginner, an, a child, an adult, or even a, a top professional. It's getting them to understand and believe what you're telling them and how to implement the training to learn section and the, and the training to perform section. Trust in you as a coach to be able to deliver that and get them to change the way that they continually train. Because, again, it's 
golfers, I'm, I'm on the range teaching of a night time and there's 60 golfers, for example, let's say, all hitting balls one after the other. But it's how do we now, for me, I want to try and revolutionize coaching and get people to understand that we can train more effectively to become better. And I'm trying to change that mentality with 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 golfers, obviously, especially because that's my that's my niche market. But how how would you advise me as a coach to try and implement this to to, to players well, of I all think, levels? I think it, it, I mean it, it is quite challenging to do, but I think it's vital that you accept the challenge. So I, I would say, well, okay, let's just look at strike and line. And you do so many of that, so you could call that the pair. Right now, let's look at training, and now we're going for a target. Okay. So I want to look at strike and line, but also how many do you get in this three meter channel that I put out um, 100 yards or, or, or whatever? And once it becomes an outcome, now this is important, a lot of people sadly are caught up with this out of assessment. So, you know, if you said to them, okay, so rate your putting and go, Oh, three hours. So recording your recording well, your. No, it's no? not the recording. It's actually the, the 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 message that goes with assessment. So if I'm not very good at something, okay, I start at three. Okay, might be two. Yeah. You say. So what do you like out the bunker? Well, oh, probably about three out of ten. And what do you like? Um, the long iron going into the green. Well, I enjoy doing that. Okay, I'm about eight out of ten. Okay. Those numbers, the three out of ten and the eight out of ten, are totally irrelevant. Okay. And this is why. If I do a test, and, and this is a, an important part about timing, okay? if I do a test okay, and I'm out of 10, how many do I get out of 10 attempts? In my head, wh whatever we say and whatever you say, if I get three, I'm not very good. No matter how, I'm not very good. Yeah. If I get all 10, I'm pretty cool, and this is probably too easy for me. Now, I would say, okay, so what about the three out of ten? And make it more difficult. So rather than be having success or failure, I'm a failure if it's three, two out of ten, is actually, you say, everybody can be successful, but some people can get there quicker. And the way we manage that is how many shots does it take you to get five within a channel? Yeah. So everybody is going to be successful. Now that's a great starting point because then the model becomes, okay, it took me 15 shots and you don't mind taking 15 shots because you actually achieved it. So there's an achievement there. Now I have been successful at 15 shots, but if I could achieve the same number with less shots, I will be even better. Yeah. So my mentality is completely different from an out of which gives me a pass or fail. Well, what else have we got on there, Dave? Uh, ugly zone, we covered that. Uh, taking responsibility for their own improvement. Yeah, So if I ask you a question, then what, what question do you want me to well, you just say relevance well, of what you well, do with an elite well, golfer and well, an average well, golfer? Well, no, no, I'd actually say, okay, so in terms of players that, you know, are, are going to progress the net, what do you think is the single most important um, uh, characteristic? And I'll say the ones that take responsibility, and then I'm going to show you. Okay. Okay. So how... Um, no, how do you train people to take responsibility? Okay, yeah, perfect. So, Dave, how would you get people to take responsibility over their training? Well, I think, um, first of all, they, they, they have to understand that the first part of any improvement is better than you were before. Yep. The issue with that is, where was I before? So you have to get players to make notes. How many did it take to get five out of from 25 yards yeah. and so on? And then you celebrate those performances that have improved from previous. Yeah. So it's like a, a starting point, for example. Um, establish, yeah, you establish, establish your starting point. Where you are at That's currently. It. That's it. So we, we just call that a snapshot. Okay, now we've got look, short putts, long putts, chipping, blah, 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 et cetera. Now, can we systematically get better 
than I was before on all of those. Now, there are a number of things. Number one, I am the only one responsible. Yeah. I'm not affected by anybody else. No. So I can take complete responsibility because I have complete control. All right? The second thing is it gets people to start looking and challenging themselves. I did a PB the other day. Now, when you follow this along and you start getting a lot of data, then you can create a thing which I call substantiated confidence. I know that if you've got a wedge in your hand, okay, and you're on the fairway, you will get it on the green. Yeah. How do I know? Because I've got all the data that shows me I can get within 10 feet and that because I've worked and worked and worked it. Now that to me is confidence that me as a player, I've created facts to tell me I can do it. If I've got those facts, I'm in a far better place and my confidence is not misplaced, but I can say, okay, well, the pins at the back of the green is four meters from the edge. I can still attack the pin because I've been practicing within a three meter bucket all this time and statistically, and 85% of getting it there. Just having that confidence then, isn't it? So then knowing when you're out on the course in certain situations that you're able to do it. in Because the... you've done it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and they've done it. Now, in all sports, um, we tend to think that by fixing mistakes is the best improvement. So naturally, we write down the areas that we, we want to fix. I actually think that's the wrong way. Okay. I think we need to spend more time at our starting point to create where am I now? What am I good at? Yeah. Okay. And and start from there. Because if you if you look at any form of training, if you make a big fuss about what you don't want to do, how many times have I told you not to drop the ball or whatever it is? Okay, and we ignore it when it's right. We've totally reversed the brain's learning process. The, the brain wants to feel good. You're always going to practice the things that you feel good at doing. Yeah, and that's where the sort of performance system that I put together for my players to sort of work with it really highlights and identifies them key areas of the game that they really need to work on to get the percentages percentages up. And, and that's very similar to. Uh, the performance journal that I've created, which is a tool which is actually based on behavior change. Um, and this journal, um, you can start at any time of the year. And the thing that's different about it, whereas a lot of the diaries, um, you know, you print the front and so on and so forth, all our resources are online. So when a person gets the journal, he, he gets a personal login from DARE, which is a company in England that does them. And we are constantly updating those tutorials. So we cover things like resetting. You know, every day is not going to be perfect. We know that. So isn't it better to go, okay, right, hold it, hold it, hold it. Right, let me start again. Let me reset. Now, some people go, oh, they had to reset. I see to identify the need to be able to reset and do it is a massive strength. Yeah. And, and those processes, so attitude and application, need to be highlighted. And, and if we're coaching particularly youngsters, where parents sadly think that you know, their kid is going to be the next Rory McIlroy or Tiger Woods or whatever, we know there is only two of those and there's however many million golfers. So statistically, it's not very high. But if we work hard at our golf and we look at our attitude application and commitment and we as coaches actually commend those and highlight those as wow i'm really impressed the way you've gone out and trained every day and putting and so on rather than how many putts did you get okay those qualities will be with you for life yeah whatever you do yeah 100 percent. and that is really important for parents of youngsters particularly young kids where People think, you know, they, they may have a bright future and so on. Just remember, not everybody's going to make it for whatever reason, and it's not going to be lack of effort, okay? Then you need to, well, what else did I get out of it? 
Yeah. And if it's the discipline, commitment, and attitude, then golf has been a, a, a wonderful leather for your life. Okay, so we were talking earlier about the application and the responsibility of that particular individual to put these actions into place when they're training to learn and training to perform. Um, I have uh, obviously uh, a lot of experience with uh, young uh, juniors that are developing and, and, and coming up through the, the golf performance system we've got here at Emirates Golf Club and the Peter Cowan Academy. And how would you go about sort of almost persuading or getting that that young junior that potentially could be a very, very good golfer to believe and have trust in you and your knowledge to put this sort of practice and training into, into play? Um, I know this sounds a, a, a contradiction, um, but I try and get the kids to enjoy getting in the open zone. Yeah. where it is frustrating and it is tough and I, oh, I missed again and I keep going and so on and then when you create that environment and you see them struggling you commend the effort you're straight in to say how good is this this is awesome and it legitimizes challenge now kids actually like challenge believe it or not and if it's too easy they will with their own games they'll make it a bit more difficult at some point, unfortunately, we challenge ourselves to get better, challenge ourselves to get better, and then all of a sudden, instead of getting better, we actually don't want to get any worse. And we flip the coin and try and not make mistakes. Now, I'm saying we need to have that childlike attitude of a five-year-old right through to the whatever. Just keep going. Just get but on with you it. can always, always improve. And and I I think that often we don't give time to celebrating the development of process. We just become outcome related. Okay, what 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 did you um what how did you shoot to the weekend? Okay, what position were you? Not how did you play? Did you enjoy it? Okay, tell me about the good shots. Now if you got into that habit you would actually prolong the involvement in golf of that individual. Yeah. Um, and, and sadly, because of the society we're in, we're straight into... Negativity. Negativity, outcome, outcome, outcome. I, I remember talking to some parents of, of young rugby players. And uh, obviously rugby is competitive. We've got 30 players and they're all training hard and playing against each other for... The team on Saturday, and I remember talking to the parents, and and I I said to them, okay, so you've just picked up your 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 son or daughter from training. What's the first thing you you ask them? He said, ah, oh, how's it going? Do you have a good day at school and so on? And then they actually opened up and far more honest when they said, well, are you in the team? Now, that's fine if they are in the team, but if they're not in the team. Okay, then it's, I'm a failure. That It doesn't matter how we dress it up, I'm a failure. So if the parent could actually say, well, how was the week? What, what, what did you learn this week? You know, what, was, what were the enjoyable bits? You, you know, you know um, and, and start getting into the process, reliving the experience, taking out the bits that you want and ignoring the stuff that you don't want, right? They're not on the team on Saturday. Oh, so what? I remember... When George Ford was at Leicester, the first time he was at Leicester, he wasn't getting games at all. And it was actually quite difficult for him. And I just got into the attitude and say, look, their loss, another opportunity for us to get better on the weekend and go out and do a really good practice session on the weekend rather than play. So let's take whatever we're given and make something out of it. Um, and it, it's not easy. But it's much better that way around than the other way around that actually says, okay, you're not in the team. What do, what do we have to do to get back in the team? Because if getting back in the team is everything, then that is outcome. If you look after the processes, you will improve and you will get back in the team. So again, it's how you apply yourself to, to certain situations. To the process. Yeah.
So in terms, so now moving on to uh, routines on the golf course, whether it be a putting routine or a, a, a teeing off pre-shot routine, uh, I use something called Osvia. So when I was going through my PGA training, um, I had a, a friend that is a golf psychologist, and he uh, he taught me this process. And basically, Osvia is observation of the shot, selection of the club, a visualization. Um, uh, an execution of the shot, and then after, so to speak, like the tiger, the tiger um, era, he he's got like this bubble around him, and as soon as he walks out the bubble after the shot, he sort of forgets about his shot. So, how would you advise people to really work on their process when they're when they're training? Yeah, I, th I think um, I mean a pre a pre shot routine is absolutely vital. Whether it's a specific one that everybody has the same, I disagree with. I think it's whatever gets you to prepare well. Now, if we're under pressure and, and our mind is allowed to be receptive to everything else around it, I do worry that there are thoughts in there that aren't particularly helpful. So the first thing I do is, is get the player to pick out the target, but not just, well, slightly to the left of the flag or let's go to the right side of the fairway. It's not good. You're really, really what, sort of pinpoint what piece of turn, Where What shadow are you actually aiming on the right side? And although it sounds a little bit, oh, aren't you just being a bit pedantic? I said, well, no, because if the brain is really, really focused, and then I get them to take a picture in their mind's eye, so that when I'm over the ball, I can still see the target vividly in my mind's eye. And what that tends to do is, as I hit, my energy and thought is going towards the target. Yeah. Right? Now, um, if you want to look at that, which is a bit more um, obvious, is look at goal kickers in rugby, and you'll see them look at the ball and look up at the post. Now, the interesting thing is that the goal kicker has to superimpose his own target in a gap. There isn't anything there. No. Um, and the geometry of picking a spot behind the post doesn't work because if I'm standing behind the ball and uh, Doris has got her little purple hat on and she's dead in front of the post, that's a really good target line. But actually, when I've taken three paces to the side, she's no longer in the middle. No, so that's no good. So I need to find something that's on a plane with the crossbar in a single spot. And visualizing that spot and looking up and fixing it, and then back and looking up and fixing it. And then as I come in, it's in my mind's eye. So that to me is one of the most important parts of the process to get you to, if you like, throw your energy, thought, and being towards the target. So that vision, that visualization almost is creating the action that you need to deliver on the ball. Is that what you're sort well, of Well, it to certainly. Say? Uh, it, it helps us direct the force through the, all the other things, which is just, I mean, I often say uh, to a, a player when I'm working with them, this would be a tall player, um, okay, that one, you really hit that with your soul. Yeah. In other words, you were right on top of it. The ball wasn't going anyway, but straight to the target. You imposed yourself on the ball. And that comes sort of quite nicely to the second thing is, what mode and emotional ticket do you have to have to be able to produce that? Now, you can't be passive and dominate the ball. Yeah. There, there has to be a bit of aggression. So it's teaching people that, you know, you have to mean it. You have to get over the ball and actually decide this ball is going, not, oh, let's hit it and see where it goes. Yeah. Because that's an apology. Okay, so you need to really dominate the contact and just the words like dominate get over the board gives a picture of the sort of emotion that you need it's not a passive you know you're not an artist anymore. You're, you're basically an enforcer yeah but an enforcer with deadly accuracy and the, some of the metaphors i've used have been the the ice cold evil assassin so then for those golfers that are sort of stood on the range just hitting golf balls with no real direct target or means of direction or focus, 
how would you get them to go through a process on the range that can relate to the golf course? So, for example, I get them to maybe say for the last 20 minutes of their session, they would pull 20 balls to the side of their range map. Every shot that they hit is a different club selection and they go through the process as if they are playing on the golf course. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I quite like that. Um, I just think that, I mean, you hear stories of people saying, I've got an, and I'm going to play a driver on the first one. So I think that's fine, and, and it has got its measure, merit. And I do like the bit that you're changing the club every time. So I'm getting lots and lots of first shots, which is, is my match shot. Okay? The one thing that, that concerns me a little bit is that... In the same way that we have a certain amount of energy, we also have a certain amount of mental energy. Of course. And I think that um, the repair training match, okay, I want to work on my techniques, repair the training, I want to hit my reps. The match becomes, let's make something special out of it. I would rather have 10 match shots interspersed with other stuff than say, right, it's 25 shots, I want you to really concentrate on every one of these. Because yeah. I don't think it, it happens. And, and you, you want to try and make an event out of it. So you're building up a mental stamina. But a mental stamina that gives you the ability to be precise in what you're thinking specifically and how you're thinking about it. So Dave, as we've mentioned your book earlier, um, what other things in there, like language, um, would you be able to sort of direct towards a, a golfer trying to change performance? Well, certainly um, the, the, the chapter on anxiety is to how to perceive uh, a, a situation where it has become anxious into us and to reframe it so it's a situation where it gives you energy and you're, you're excited rather than dreading something. Um, I... I, I I was half tempted to try and write the book, if you like, on mental bits like pre-shot routine and so on. But I've actually found in my experience that actually it was better to write it in a way that the chapters uh, really cover areas to look at. Like, for example, there is one chapter which is on the environment. Okay. what sort of environment gives the best training yeah. and it's actually how you can manipulate the environment um, and, and if you look at uh, you know, what is a match environment now if for example if I just give you a simple scenario if I'm trying to create a match environment in, in the golf range one of the things you could do and it means you probably have to shut it for five minutes is you go out and you get the flags and you put it out 10 different flags, yeah. as well as the markers. Wow. So I've now upped the ante completely. So I've got 10 flags and I've got cones three meters either side. Okay. Now, I want you to see how many shots it's going to take you today to get every one of those. Yeah. Now, it's, it's special, isn't it? Of it's course, suddenly, yeah. ah, and it's pushing you towards that more special of being on the course. So uh, environment's really important. Obviously language, which we've spoken about. I, I really do believe that the best coaches, and I don't mean best in terms of technique, the most effective coaches in getting players to learn uh, as effectively as they can are those that create an environment and have a relationship with the player that he can totally commit and not match his intention and still have a self-esteem intact. Yeah. And if you can create that, then you're going a long way towards getting somebody to improve, enjoy improving, and you know, who knows where they'll end up. Of course. Okay, so Dave, I would like to thank you for your time today. It's been thank an you. absolute pleasure. I've learned so much, and hopefully we can teach those golfers out there new and effective ways of training. So, guys, see the link below for Dave's book and journal, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Stay tuned for some more content, and thank you for today.